Um, again, for those of you uh, new to the briefing and the story, my name is Jennifer Rohde, and I am the uh, air safety investigator for the National Transportation Safety Board, the investigator in charge, or IC, IIC for uh, this accident investigation. Um, late uh, yesterday evening, um, we were able to get ahead of schedule with the uh, wreckage recovery, which was fortunate due to the uh, amount of snowfall that they have received in the, the Boulder area. We were able to recover all of the wreckage that was uh, flagged and identified during the uh, two-day on-scene investigation. All of the wreckage that uh, was identifiable was uh, removed from the scene and has been uh, taken north to Greeley, Colorado uh, to a, a facility uh, entitled Beagles Aircraft and the uh, wreckage will remain there for the duration of the investigation. I know one of the first questions that a lot of people have been wondering is why the airplanes weren't under control of air traffic control. And uh, kind of a misnomer that the airspace is called uncontrolled airspace. Um, actually, most of the airplanes are being tracked, but they're not required to call an air traffic controller. So most of the responsibility falls on the pilot. Um, often called see and avoid, so they just make sure that the area is clear of other airplanes, um, only used on, on clear days, like it was on Saturday. Uh, like today it wouldn't work, that's why you're not seeing any airplanes flying in the air. But uh, there's also a radio frequency that is assigned to this area, and so the pilots can make radio calls on the frequency, but they don't actually make them to anybody in particular, they just make these broadcast calls of their position, their altitude, their intentions. Um, sometimes they'll even ask, are there other airplanes in the area? You know, so they're basically controlling themselves. And um, in some ways it works um, even better because the pilot doesn't have a false sense of security. It's up to them to be clearing the airspace around them. And you know, we operate that, day, uh, that way 365 days a year. And uh, very few incidences uh, anywhere in the United States in uncontrolled airspace. Um, but yes, the, the onus is on the pilots involved. Late yesterday evening, we uh, had an opportunity to speak with the uh, pilot of the uh, Schweitzer glider, and uh, his uh, statement to us verbally during our interview was consistent with the written statement uh, that uh, he had provided to the uh, Boulder Police Department and the uh, Boulder County Sheriff's Office. And uh, again, to reiterate that statement, um, he was in flight behind the uh, Piper Pawnee tow plane. The uh, flight was um, in a uh, level, as, as in the, uh, the airplanes were not banking. They were in a level flight. They were in a slight climb. They were approximately 70 miles an hour in airspeed. When he noticed out of the corner of his eye the uh, Cirrus airplane moving towards him, he described it uh, silver in color and uh, immediately uh, felt the, uh, the perception that uh, there was going to be an impact between the Cirrus and possibly the tow rope. And so he reached to release between the uh, glider, Schweitzer, and the uh, Piper Pawnee tow plane. And uh, very shortly thereafter, the Cirrus impacted the uh, right side of the Piper Pawnee. According to radar data and statements from the pilot, the Cirrus was southbound and appeared to be in nearly straight and level flight. There was no bank. There was no maneuver involved. He was wings level, and there appeared to be no climb or descent from his perception. And the same w held true for the uh, Piper Pawnee and the, the glider tow flight. They were in a westbound direction, again, approximately 70 miles per hour. And there was absolutely no maneuver and no movement of the Piper Pawnee prior to the impact. This morning, we continued uh, with the uh, course of our investigation. We were able to uh, interview both passengers that were on board the airplane, and uh, their uh, statements are exactly consistent with the written statements that they provided previously and consistent with uh, the uh, pilot's uh, statement of the uh, Schweitzer glider. Uh, this afternoon, we've gathered uh, evidence here in the uh, Boulder area. We documented uh, the glider, and uh, at this point, we can state that uh, the glider sustained absolutely no damage during the impact sequence despite its flight through the uh, fireball shortly after the impact between the uh, Schweiz or the excuse me the Pawnee and the uh, Cirrus aircraft. Um, the remainder of the day will be spent um, following up with uh, the multitude of witnesses who have called and left messages and sent uh, emails 
passing on to us uh, their uh, statements, their observations, their photographs. Um, tomorrow morning, we will start up at uh, Beagle's Aircraft at 7.30, and we will do a partial 3D reconstruction of the Piper Pawnee, and that will allow us to understand a little bit more of the impact angles between the uh, Cirrus and the Piper Pawnee. Uh, one of our pilots that I work with here at the airport was in the area flying when this happened. And that, he said that was actually the first time he knew about the, the collision because uh, Ruben, the glider pilot, called up on that radio frequency and declared Mayday. And uh, Tracy was this gentleman's name that was flying. And he basically responded to Ruben and, and reassured him that they would call 911 and they would get all the you know, emergency apparatus and help in any way he could. And uh, so I, I think you know, that was probably the first 911 call. I imagine there were many afterward when people saw the smoke. But the initial Mayday call was made by Ruben. And um, I, I, I believe, and obviously I'm not 100% sure, but Tracy said Ruben uh, kind of circled a few times to see if he could assist or gather any information that might be helpful later and then was, was able to you know keep his composure and come back to the airport and land uneventfully after that happened. Um, it's hard to say at this point if if they saw each other and didn't have time to avoid each other or if there was a you know glare off the windshield it's really hard to say and the NTSB they're experts at at finding all the pieces and putting them back together again so I think after all the interviews and looking at the equipment and the eyewitnesses and things, I think we'll have a better picture of what happened. But it, I think it's, it would be, you know, an error to try to speculate at this point, you know, why the two planes uh, collided. Again, that final factual report comes out between six and eight months after the initiation of the investigation. And we don't do that to uh, keep everybody on edge. We do that so that we're slow and methodical and we don't miss or overlook any aspects of safety that uh, may be pertinent to this accident. The portion, or the purpose rather, of the uh, National Transportation Safety Board is to establish the facts and circumstances surrounding the accident, establish a probable cause, that is from our five-member board in Washington, D.C., that's approximately two months after the release of the final factual report, and to make recommendations and identify methods where we can improve aviation safety so that accidents like this don't happen again.